We've got a question over here from uh, James Carter. Mr. Carter. My question is, do you believe you can be a devoted president to all the people in the United States? That question begins for Mr. Trump. Absolutely. I mean, uh, she calls our people deplorable, a large group, and irredeemable. I will be a president for all of our people, and I'll be a president that will turn our inner cities around and will give strength to people and will give economics to people and will bring jobs back because NAFTA, signed by her husband, is perhaps the greatest disaster trade deal in the history of the world, not in this country. It stripped us of manufacturing jobs. We lost our jobs. We lost our money. We lost our plants. It is a disaster. And now she wants to sign TPP, even though she says now she's for it. She called it the gold standard. And by the way, at the last debate, she lied because it turned out that she did say the gold standard, and she said she didn't say it. They actually said that she lied, okay? And she lied, but she's lied about a lot of things. I would be a president for all of the people, African Americans, the inner cities, devastating what's happening to our inner cities. She's been talking about it for years. As usual, she talks about it, nothing happens. She doesn't get it done. Same with the Latino Americans, the Hispanic Americans, the same exact thing. They talk, they don't get it done. You go into the inner cities and you see it's 45% poverty. African Americans now 45% poverty in the inner cities. The education is a disaster. Jobs are essentially non-existent. I mean, it's, you know, I, and I've been saying at big speeches where I have 20 and 30,000 people, what do you have to lose? It can't get any worse. And she's been talking about the inner cities for 25 years. Nothing's going to ever happen. Let me tell you, if she's president of the United States, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be talk. And all of her friends, the taxes we were talking about, and I would just get it by osmosis. She's not doing any me favors. But by doing all the others' favors, she's doing me favors. Mr. Trump, thank but, you. But I will tell you, she's all talk. It doesn't get done. All you have to do is take a look at her Senate run. Take a look at upstate New York. Your two minutes is up. Secretary Clinton, two minutes. It turned out to be a disaster. You have two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Well, 67% of the people voted to reelect me when I ran for my second term. And I was very proud and very humbled by that. Mr. Carter. I have tried my entire life to do what I can to support children and families. You know, right out of law school, I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. And Donald talks a lot about, you know, the 30 years I've been in public service. I'm proud of that. You know, I started off as a young lawyer working against discrimination against African American children in schools and in the criminal justice system. I worked to make sure that kids with disabilities could get a public education, something that I care very much about. I have worked with Latinos. One of my first jobs in politics was down in South Texas registering Latino citizens to be able to vote. So I have a deep devotion, to use your absolutely correct word, to making sure that every American feels like he or she has a place in our country. And I think when you look at the letters that I get, a lot of people are worried that maybe they wouldn't have a place in Donald Trump's America. They write me, and one woman wrote me about her son, Felix. She adopted him from Ethiopia when he was a toddler. He's 10 years old now. This is the only country he's ever known. And he listens to Donald on TV, and he said to his mother one day, will he send me back to Ethiopia if he gets elected? You know, children listen to what is being said, to go back to the very, very first question. And there's a lot of fear that, in fact, teachers and parents are calling it the Trump effect. Bullying is up. A lot of people are feeling, you know, uneasy. A lot of kids are expressing their concerns. So first and foremost, 
I will do everything I can to reach out to everybody, Secretary Democrats, Clinton. Republicans, independents, people across our country. If you don't vote for me, I still want to be your president. Your I want to be the up. best president I can be for every American. Secretary Clinton, your two minutes is up. I want to follow up on something that Donald Trump actually said to you, uh, a comment you made last month. You said that half of Donald Trump's supporters are, quote, deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. You later said you regretted saying half. You didn't express regret for using the term deplor deplorables. To Mr. Carter's question, how can you unite a country if you've written off tens of millions of Americans? Well, within hours, I, I said that I was sorry about the way I, I um, talked about that because my argument is not with his supporters. It's with him and with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run and the inciting of violence at his rallies and the very uh, brutal kinds of comments about not just women, but all Americans, all kinds of Americans. And what he has said about African Americans and Latinos, about Muslims, about POWs, uh, about immigrants, about people with disabilities, he's never apologized for. And so I do think that a lot of the tone and tenor that he has said, I'm proud of the campaign that Bernie Sanders and I ran. We ran a campaign based on issues, not insults, and he is supporting me 100%. Thank you. Because we talked about what we wanted to do. We might have had some differences, and we had a lot of debate. Thank you, Secretary. But we believed that we could make the country better, and I was proud of that. I'll give you a minute, 20 We have a divided nation. We have a very divided nation. You look at Charlotte. You look at Baltimore. You look at the violence that's taking place in the inner cities, Chicago. You take a look at Washington, D.C. We have an increase in murder within our cities, the biggest in 45 years. We have a divided nation because people like her, and believe me, she has tremendous hate in her heart. And when she said deplorables, she meant it. And when she said irredeemable, they're irredeemable. You didn't mention that. But when she said they're irredeemable, to me that might have been even worse. She said she's some of them are irredeemable. She's got tremendous hatred. And this country cannot take another four years of Barack Obama. And that's what you're getting with her. Mr. Trump, let me follow up with you. In 2008, you wrote in one of your books that the most important characteristic of a good leader is discipline. You said if a leader doesn't have it, quote, he or she won't be one for very long. In the days after the first debate, you sent out a series of tweets from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., including one that told people to check out a sex tape. Is that the discipline of a good no, leader? No, it wasn't se check out a sex tape. It you was just take a look at the person that she built up to be this wonderful uh, Girl Scout who was no Girl Scout. You mentioned by the, the way, just tape. so you understand, when she said 3 o'clock in the morning, take a look at Benghazi. She said, who's going to answer the call at 3 o'clock in the morning? Guess what? She didn't answer because when Ambassador Stevens... The question is, is that the discipline minute, of a good leader? 600 times. Well, she said she was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she also sent a tweet out at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I won't even mention that. But she said she'll be awake. Who's got the famous thing? We're going to answer our call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Guess what happened? Ambassador Stevens, Ambassador Stevens sent 600 requests for help. And the only one she talked to was Sidney Blumenthal, who's her friend and not a good guy, by the way. So, you know, she shouldn't be talking about that. Now, tweeting happens to be a modern day form of communication. I mean, you can like it or not like it. I have, between Facebook and Twitter, I have almost 25 million people. It's a very effective way of communication. So you can put it down, but it is a very effective form of communication. I'm not unproud of it, to be honest with you. Secretary Clinton, does Mr. Trump have the discipline to be a good leader? No. I'm shocked to hear that. Well, it's, it's, it's not only my opinion, it's the opinion of many others, uh, national security experts, Republicans, former Republican members of Congress. But it's in part because those of us who have had the great privilege of seeing this job up close and know how difficult it is, and it's not just because I watched my husband take a $300 billion deficit and turn it into a $200 billion surplus, and 23 million new jobs were created, and incomes went up for everybody, everybody. African-American incomes went up 33%. And it's not just because I worked with George W. Bush after 9-11, and I was very proud that when I told him what the city needed, what we needed to recover, he said, you've got it, and he never wavered. He stuck with me. 
And I have worked and I admire President Obama. He inherited the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. That was a terrible time for our country. We have to move along. Nine million people Secretary lost their Clinton, jobs. We have to... Five million homes were lost. Secretary and $13 Clinton, we're moving trillion dollars on. in family wealth was wiped out. We are back on the right track. He would send us back into recession with his tax plans. Secretary Clinton, we are moving to an audience question. We're almost out of time. We have, we have another. Mr. Trump, we're moving to an audience question. Since 1929, it is our country Mr. Trump, has the Secretary slowest Clinton, we want to get to the audience. Thank you very much, both of you. <laughs> we have another audience question. Beth Miller has a question for both candidates. Um, good evening. Perhaps the most important aspect of this election is the Supreme Court justice. What would you prioritize as the most important aspect of selecting a Supreme Court justice? We begin with your two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Thank you. Well, you're right. This is one of the most important uh, issues in this election. Um, I want to uh, appoint Supreme Court justices who understand the way the world really works, who have real life experience, who have not just been in a big law firm and maybe clerked for a judge and then gotten on the bench, but you know, maybe they tried some more cases. They actually understand what people are up against because I think the current court has gone in the wrong direction. And so I would want to see uh, the Supreme Court uh, reverse Citizens United and get dark, unaccountable money out of our politics. Donald doesn't agree with that. I would like the Supreme Court to understand that voting rights are still a big problem in many parts of our country, that we don't always do everything we can to make it possible for people of color and older people and young people to be able to exercise their franchise. I want a Supreme Court that will stick with Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to choose, and I want a Supreme Court that will stick with marriage equality. Now, Donald has put forth the names of some people that he would consider. And among the ones that he has suggested are people who would reverse Roe v. Wade and reverse marriage equality. I think that would be a terrible mistake and would take us backwards. I want a Supreme Court that doesn't always side with corporate interests. I want a Supreme Court that understands because you're wealthy and you can give more money to something doesn't mean you have any more rights or should have any more rights than anybody else. So I have very clear views about what I want to see to tend to change the balance on the Supreme Court. And I regret deeply that the Senate has not done its job and they have not permitted a vote on the person that President Obama, a highly qualified person, they've not given him a vote to be able to have the full complement of nine Supreme Court justices. I think that was a dereliction of duty. Uh, I hope that they will see their way to doing it, but if I am uh, so fortunate enough as to be president, I will immediately uh, move to make sure that we fill that. We have nine Thank justices you, Secretary and Clinton. work on behalf of our people. Thank you. You're out of time, Mr. Trump. Justice Scalia, great judge, died recently, and we have a vacancy. I am looking to appoint judges very much in the mold of Justice Scalia. I'm looking for judges, and I've actually picked 20 of them, so that people would see, highly respected, highly thought of, and actually very beautifully reviewed by just about everybody, but people that will respect the Constitution of the United States. And I think that this is so important. Also, the Second Amendment, which is totally under siege by people like Hillary Clinton. They'll respect the Second Amendment and what it stands for, what it represents. Uh, so important to me. Now, Hillary mentioned something about uh, contributions, just so you understand. So I will have in my race more than $100 million put in of my money, meaning I'm not taking all of this big money from all of these different corporations like she's doing. What I ask is this. So I'm putting in more than, by the time it's finished, I'll have more than $100 million invested pretty much self-funding mine. We're raising money for the Republican Party, and we're doing tremendously on the small donation, $61 average or so. I asked Hillary, why doesn't she made $250 million by being in office? She used the power of her office to make a lot of money. 
Why isn't she funding, uh, not for $100 million, but why don't you put 10 or 20 or 25 or $30 million into your own campaign? It's $30 million less for special interests that will tell you exactly what to do. And it would really, I think, be a nice sign to the American public. Why aren't you putting some money in? You have a lot of it. You've made a lot of it because of the fact that you've been in office. You made a lot of it while you were Secretary of State, actually. So why aren't you putting money into your own campaign? I'm just curious. Well, thank you very much. About, thank you. We're going to get on to one more question. The question was about the Supreme Court, and I just want to quickly say... Very quickly. I respect the Second Amendment, but I believe there should be comprehensive background checks, and we should close the gun show loophole and close the online loophole. Thank you. We have, we we have one more question, Mr. Clinton. ...as we possibly can. We have one more question from Ken Bone about uh, energy policy. Ken? What steps will your energy policy take to meet our energy needs while at the same time remaining environmentally friendly and minimizing job loss for fossil power plant workers? Mr. Trump, two minutes. Absolutely. I think it's such a great question because energy is under siege by the Obama administration, under absolute siege. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is killing these energy companies. And foreign companies are now coming in buying our buying so many of our different plants, and then rejiggering the plant so that they can take care of their oil. We are killing, absolutely killing, our energy business in this country. Now, I'm all for alternative forms of energy, including wind, including solar, etc. But we need much more than wind and solar. And you look at our miners. Hillary Clinton wants to put all the miners out of business. There is a thing called clean coal. Coal will last for a thousand years in this country. Now we have natural gas and so many other things because of technology. We have unbelievable, we have found over the last seven years, we have found tremendous wealth right under our feet. So good, especially when you have 20 trillion in debt. I will bring our energy companies back. They'll be able to compete. They'll make money. They'll pay off our national debt. They'll pay off our tremendous budget deficits, which are are tremendous, but we are putting our energy companies out of business. We have to bring back our workers. You take a look at what's happening to steel and the cost of steel and China dumping vast amounts of steel all over the United States, which essentially is killing our steel workers and our steel companies. We have to guard our energy companies. We have to make it possible. The EPA is so restrictive that they are putting our energy companies out of business. And all you have to do is go to a great place like West Virginia or places like Ohio, which is phenomenal, or places like Pennsylvania, and you see what they're doing to the people, the miners and others in the energy business. It's a disgrace. Your time is up. Thank you, It's sir. an absolute disgrace. And actually, Mr. Secretary Clinton, two minutes. Well, that was very interesting. Um, first of all, China is illegally dumping steel in the United States, and Donald Trump is buying it to build his buildings, putting steel workers and American steel plants out of business. That's something that I fought against as a senator and that I would have a, a trade prosecutor to make sure that we don't get taken advantage of by China on steel or anything else. You know, because it sounds like you're in the business or you're aware of people in the business, you know that we are now for the first time ever energy independent. We are not dependent upon the Middle East, but the Middle East still controls a lot of the prices. So the price of oil has been way down, and that has had a damaging effect on a lot of the oil companies, right? We are, however, producing a lot of natural gas, which serves as a bridge to more uh, renewable fuels, and I think that's an important uh, transition. We've got to remain energy independent. It gives us much more power and freedom than to be worried about what goes on in the Middle East. We have enough worries over there without having to worry about that. So I have a comprehensive energy policy, but it really does include fighting climate change because I think that is a serious problem. And I support moving toward more clean, renewable energy as quickly as we can. Uh, because I think we can be the 21st century clean energy superpower and create millions of new jobs and businesses. But I also want to be sure that we don't leave people behind. That's why I'm the only candidate from the very beginning of this campaign who had a plan 
to help us revitalize coal country because those coal miners and their fathers and their grandfathers, they dug that coal out. A lot of them lost their lives. They were injured, but they turned the lights on and they powered our factories. I don't want to walk away from them, so we've got to do something for them. Perfect. But the Can price of coal is down worldwide. So we have to look at this comprehensively, and that's up. exactly what I have proposed. I hope you will go to HillaryClinton.com and we have, more, my we have entire policy. One we more have, audience question. We've sneaked in one more question, and it comes from Carl Becker. My question to both of you is, regardless of the current rhetoric, would either of you name one positive thing that you respect in one another? Mr. Trump, would you like to go first? Well, I, I certainly will because uh, I think that's a, a very fair and important question. Look, I respect his children. His children are incredibly able and devoted, and I think that says a lot about Donald. I don't agree with nearly anything else he says or does, but I do respect that, and I think that is something uh, that as a mother and a grandmother is very important to me. Uh, so. I believe that this election has become in part so, um, so conflict-oriented, so intense, uh, because there's a lot at stake. This is not an ordinary time and this is not an ordinary election. We are going to be choosing a president who will set policy for not just four or eight years, but because of some of the important decisions we have to make here at home and around the world, from the Supreme Court to energy and so much else. And so there is a lot at stake. It's one of the most consequential elections that we've had. And that's why I've tried to put forth specific policies and plans, trying to get it off of the personal and put it on to what it is I want to do as president. And that's why I hope people will uh, check on that for themselves so that they can see uh, that, yes, I've spent 30 years, actually maybe a little more, uh, working to help kids and families. And I want to take all that experience uh, to the White House and do that every single day. Mr. Trump. Well, I consider her statement about my children to be a very nice compliment. I don't know if it was meant to be a compliment, but it is a great. I'm very proud of my children. And uh, they've done a wonderful job, and they've been wonderful, wonderful kids. So uh, I consider that a compliment. Uh, I will say this about Hillary. She doesn't quit. She doesn't give up. I respect that. I tell it like it is. She's a fighter. I disagree with much of what she's fighting for. I do disagree with her judgment in many cases. But she does fight hard, and she doesn't quit, and she doesn't give up. And I consider that to be a very good trait. Thanks to both of you. I want to thank both the, uh, the candidates. I want to thank the, uh, the university here. This concludes the town hall meeting. Our thanks to the candidates, the commission, Washington University, and to everybody who watched. Please tune in on October 19th for the final presidential debate that will take place at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Good night, everyone.